you stare into the abyss, the abyss stares back. Why are humans so obsessed with death? Would we have such a short time to live? Is something on the other side? Amor Fati, a term coined by Frederick Nietzsche when he was philosophizing his views on life and death. Although Nietzsche did have some avant-garde beliefs, he also suggested that people need to accept their fate. Instead of being scared of death, resenting it, he encouraged a life was to be lived as it would one day end. To caveat these beliefs, he criticized religion. It was too focused on avoidance of the present. Religion was escapism that detracted from the will of power for some human's life. Like many thought leaders of the day, both then and now, humans don't seem to care or listen. The evolutionary desire for belonging, acceptance, and community masks them with a dissociation from reality that religion provides. We start our exploration of death by studying the early Christians. Why them? Well, because they originated here in Cappadocia, in Turkey, and hid out for a couple hundred years until Christianity went viral in the later years of the Roman Empire. As many of you know, in the early first century, there was a dude from Nazareth named Yeshua. Or the English translation of this was Joshua. Yeshua was a very popular name, and because people really didn't have last names back then, it always came with a designation. For this dude, it was Yeshua of Nazareth, or as we know today, Jesus of Nazareth. Now it's important to note, it wasn't until the early 1600s when the British monarch, King James, decided to have the original Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic transcripts translated into English, did the name Jesus start to appear in modern English. King James decided Jesus was easier to say than Yeshua, and voila, here we are. So back to why this matters in Cappadocia. See, as with many of the other people who weren't a fan of the Roman Empire, this person Yeshua wasn't super popular back in his day. Yeshua was known to frequent existing temples and denounce the different gods there. He attested that instead of numerous Roman gods that demanded worship, sacrifice, and money of people, there was just one. And over time, there was a series of unexplainable events that Yeshua performed that demonstrated he had a miraculous power invested in him by the one true God. Thus, self-attributing the name to himself to be the Son of God. Due to his baller self-promotion and marketing abilities, Yeshua acquired a group of super close homies that would carry on his legacy after the Romans put an end to his life. Those who continued to follow the teachings of him continued to build on the text and structure of his beliefs. As this was not trendy in the Roman Empire, the early Christians had to flee for their life and also work to spread the new intel they had learned in secret ways. Now, the etymology behind the word Christian is also fascinating. It's important as we uncover the mystery behind death in this area in Turkey. The English word Christian comes from the Greek word Christianos, which means follower of Christos, Christ, meaning one, and os is an adjective ending, borrowed from the Latin indicating someone adjacent to or belonging to, in such a way of slave ownership. St. Paul and St. Peter were two of the first people in the first century to come to the Ankara area in central Turkey, along with their followers, of course, and that's where we are today. Along this riverbed, caves high along the wall, hid those first followers. The water below gave the thriving Christian community a way of life, food, and refuge from the torrid desert climate. While the Romans hated what the Christians were doing, they had much bigger issues on their hands like securing the borders, keeping the Byzantines out from the north. And as the story goes, Christianity offered something that the Roman pagan religion didn't, equality. See, Roman society was all about classes and ranks and paying loads of taxes and blah, blah, blah. Starting first from the small river valley and slowly spreading out into other parts of the Middle East and the rest of the empire, Christianity slowly became the trending religion of the lower ranks of the empire's subjects. Until, of course, a Serbian dude named Constantine became emperor in 280 AD and entirely transformed the Roman Empire from paganism into Christianity. As Constantine made Christianity a cool thing, many of the underground churches 
monasteries, and cathedrals in this area were finally able to operate in the public eye. Now, as we know a bit more about the history behind why Central Turkey is key in the early Christian religion, we can now better appreciate the architecture and art behind what we see here. For over 2,000 years, humans have lived in chimney houses here. These houses are oddly shaped, for the most part, natural in how they are constructed. The soft sandstone base is covered by a roof made of weather-resistant basalt. Over time, of course, and with acid rain coming from climate changes, the basalt wears down, leading to these chimney-type structures that we see today. These little houses start coming into our awareness in history from around 150 BCE from early Silk Road stories and drawings that we see, as this area was on the trading route. Around 300 CE, the first of the monasteries started to appear in this area, and that's where more documentation around the early settlers started to form. Initially, the people in this area stayed with just a few of the same gendered people wanting to live in isolation from society and spend their time in meditation and prayer. Over time though, and as Christianity started to grow in the Roman Empire, and with the Christian-based Byzantines coming in next, the monastery started to take off into a different shape and started to boast glorious works of art and refuge for non-hermits to pray, meditate, and of course, give money to those living in these places. While some of these churches were looted for their mystical and spiritual powers, many remain in pristine condition with only slight reconstructions to remind us of how well preserved things can be that are kept isolated from the world. These churches have been the burial place of a significant number of bodies. See, the early Christians believed for a better afterlife of their dead if they could afford the burial of bones in such places as this. Archaeologists have found many of the sarcophaguses in this area have a layer of multiple bodies stacked on top of each other. They imply that because of the limited space in the holiest of monasteries, such as the one we see now, they would wait until the first body would decompose, and then after that body decomposed, open the sarcophagus again to another set of bodies and so on. And as the Catholic Church became more powerful, it also demanded money for such an act and burial in such a holiest of places. And it became a way for the churches to earn more money. Throughout nearly 10 centuries, this area was populated with people practicing Catholic religion. Although in the early 11th century, when the Ottomans took over the area, many of the residents fled into more Catholic places in the world. It's to note though, as the early Christians were able to hide here undetected for years, it was also pretty easy for them to hide from the Ottoman rule over time. Over time though, it became harder to hide, as it posed a challenge to the survivability of one's family. In the early 20th century, as the Ottoman Empire was being defeated, those practicing Christian and Catholic religions went to the Western countries, such as the Balkans and Eastern Europe. And those in the Balkan and Eastern Europe practicing Islam came over to Turkey. The thing is though, the depopulation of this area was never repopulated. There weren't jobs here. And thus for nearly 50 years, no one was watching over this place. As with everything, if there's not an owner, humans will create entropy. You'll notice in this area, the frescoes have the faces taken off the walls. Lore foretold that if you ate the eyes of the frescoes, you would be cured from a disease, have everlasting life, or have superior insight into the future. So many people made the journey here to do just that. But it's to note that these walls are covered with lapis lazuli. This is a dark blue stone from Southern Arabia and Egypt. And while lapis lazuli isn't toxic in stone form, when it comes in contact with water, it becomes extremely toxic due to the large sulfur deposits in the stone. So many people have risked their lives by consuming artwork in these temples because of some mystic lore that said it would cure a disease or give them all knowing power. They could have just read a book or seen a doctor. And this mysticism in the lore of it all brings us back to the original topic on why we started to explore here today. What was the original lure, the grab, the attention that brought people together during the time in the early first century? What started the sect of Christianity that morphed into so many other different religions and cults? If we go back to Nietzsche and associate the draw to religion, being focused on the avoidance of the presence, the escapism to detract for the will to live one's life, and the life of another, in our case, a literal Christanos, a slave of the Christ. 
Is humanity's lack of self-confidence, ownership, and a will to live that makes them drawn to enslave themselves into another religion, another thought pattern? So much that would bankrupt many people just to bury a body in a group grave and then hope that the person would have a better place in the afterlife while the present life was suffering? Was it just disgust for the current government at the time? Were people so desperate to jump on anything that wasn't Roman? And this man, Yeshua of Nazareth, who proclaimed a new religion, who talked with prostitutes and tax collectors like real people, and who could make a party appear out of anything, even water. This man they decided to follow, who promised them an eternal afterlife full of happiness, free of pain and eternal joy. Whatever the appeal was to follow this man, would reshape the course of history, would lead to the fall of the Roman Empire, and be the culprit of many genocides the world would soon see. When Christianity first formed, instead of forming an alliance to fight back against the Roman Empire or move out, they decided to form an underground cult centered around a dead guy who performed a lot of unexplainable magic. Maybe the magic was a form of a higher power, and maybe it wasn't. That's not my point to say. I do find it curious though, that if you open the door to any Christian sect today, or meet any street evangelist, the first question they will ask you is, what will you do when you die? Is death what Yeshua of Nazareth wanted his followers to focus on? Scaring people into a religion to follow him, since rarely is anyone's first thought after they're born to start thinking about their afterlife? I'm not quite sure. But I'll leave you with a quote from Albert Camus. Should I kill myself or should I have a cup of coffee?